Hi, I'm Adam from Confluent. Let's talk about event design and event streams best practices. In this module, we'll cover a number of best practices. We'll start by looking at the numerous benefits provided by event schemas and why they're absolutely necessary for using event streams. Next, we'll look at metadata and headers and the role that each play in an event-driven architecture. We'll follow this up by looking at how to name events and event streams, and we'll take a look at a couple of options to provide you with an example of where each works best. Finally, we'll cap this module off by exploring event IDs, as well as some strategies you can use to ensure that each event is uniquely identifiable. Schemas, as provided by Interface Definition Languages, or IDLs, are essential for making event streams consistent and reliable, as well as aligning producer and consumer expectations on the format of the event data. Schemas provide structure and definition for the data communicated by the event. Just as explicit schemas are essential for constructing relational database tables, schemas are also essential for defining the structure of data in an event. Apache Avro, Google's Protobuf, and JSON schema are three common IDLs that provide structure, format, and documentation for events. Schemas enable code generation as either a consumer or a producer. While your compilation options depend on both the schema IDL and the programming language you're using, the idea is that you can take the schema and compile it into a class or object suitable for your language. Compiled languages get the benefit of compile time type checking, which significantly reduces mistakes and errors in data creation and usage. Please note that these are only some examples of code generation. There are many different compilers that can convert a schema into a class or object in the language of your choice. Schemas also enable evolution to help you handle your changing business requirements. In this example, the cart fact is evolved to add a total price field to the new event. Explicit schema evolution rules provide you with a framework for negotiating changes to your events, making it much easier to express how your data can change over time. And to pin this all together, we rely on the schema registry to streamline event stream usage. The Confluent Schema Registry provides a common point of reference for both the producer and consumer of an event. Producers rely on the Schema Registry during data serialization to ensure that the schema they're using matches the expected schema for the Kafka topic. If the schema disagrees with the data being serialized, it will throw an exception, preventing any malformed data from entering the Kafka topic. The consumers rely on the schema registry to obtain a copy of the schema to deserialize the binary data back into a usable format. The schema registry plays a very important role in event-driven architectures and is essential for ensuring that both the producer and consumer of an event have a common understanding. If you'd like to learn more about schemas and the schema registry, I encourage you to go check out our Schema Registry 101 course. We cover the different kinds of schema formats, schema evolution rules, and how producers, consumers, and the schema registry all work together. We also have a number of hands-on exercises that use Confluent Cloud to illustrate how it all works in practice. Next, we'll take a look at event metadata and headers. An event is composed of a key and a value. Though the key field remains optional, it's typically populated by a primitive value for partitioning purposes. Consumers also have access to the event broker's metadata. This includes the event's topic offset, the partition, the topic, and timestamp. The timestamp value may be either the event's local creation time, as supplied by the producer, or it may be the received time provided by the event broker. Timestamps are configurable at a per topic level, so you can decide which one may work best for your use cases. Kafka also provides you with record headers. These provide a space for additional context and custom metadata about the event without affecting the structure of the key or the value. But why would you want this? Consider including information about the origin of the event, such as the system that created it, or tracking-related information to help audit event flows 
and lineages. Or, for another example, your key and value payloads may be fully encrypted for security reasons, but you could use the header to insert unclassified information about the event to ensure that it's routed correctly. Headers are not a replacement for the value payload, but rather provide supplemental information. You must explicitly share the format of the metadata key values with your consumers so that they can make appropriate use of the contents. Depending on your data governance policies and rules, you may find it useful to implement standardized event headers in your organization. A standardized header can include information pertaining to event tracking, auditing, compliance requirements, and whatever other information that every producer in your organization needs to publish. You'll also need to work with each of your event producers to ensure that they can all publish the data as required. The naming we have used so far in the modules has been fairly simple and sparse. A bit like using someone's first name instead of their full name. The deltas and facts that we've used have been quite terse and don't really provide much contextual information. But events will come from multiple areas of your organization, from different teams and systems, and embedding the contextual data into the name of the event stream can help with both stream management and discovery. Here's one option for naming event streams. In this format, we combine the domain, the event type, and the version of the stream together into a single name. For example, the orders domain from the previous domain map could contain a fax stream that contains all of the order facts. You could choose to add .v1 to the end of the name, or you could also go with a standard that anything without a version number is simply the initial version. So for example, if we take a customers.advertisement stream and we end up having to do a breaking schema change, the new customers.advertisement stream would be appended with a .v2. This indicates that there was a breaking change and that the first version would eventually be removed. We'll explain more about this in the Schema Registry 101 course. You could also choose to include the service name in the event stream naming convention. Including the service name can reduce the ambiguity about where an event originates, especially when coupled with the domain. However, one of the reasons to be careful about including the service name in the stream is that the service that produces the event may change over time. Consider an event stream produced by code inside of a monolithic service. One day, that code is refactored into its own microservice with its own new name, and ownership of the stream is transferred. The service name in the event stream title may no longer reflect the actual ownership. Names are important with Kafka event streams since they are immutable and cannot be renamed. Using service names tends to make the most sense when a stream is used internally to a domain, data on the inside, such as in the case of Delta events for event sourcing. The producer, stream, and consumer are already tightly coupled, and any changes won't impact anyone outside the domain. A third option, should you choose to leverage event headers, is to put the origin inside of the record header. This option provides you with both the origin information of the service that created the event, but also decouples the service identity from the topic name. If you end up changing the service that produces the order events, you can simply update the origin header information. Standardizing event stream names helps prospective consumers find the data that is relevant to them. It also provides clues as to which version of a stream you're planning to read from. It's always a good practice to use the most recent versions of a stream, as earlier versions are usually deprecated and will likely be removed. Event IDs provide us with the ability to uniquely identify one specific event. One of the important use cases is for auditing events. An exhaustive audit can reveal how many events were written to an event stream, which can be compared to how many events have been read on the other side. Both missing and duplicate events can be detected so that you can take appropriate compensating actions. Another use case is to use an automatically incrementing ID to ensure that events are processed in a correct sequence order, especially if you expect to see duplicates or late arriving events. The first format option we'll look at is a simple hash of the bytes in the event stream. Many current day hash functions can provide you with an extremely highly probabilistic result of uniqueness. While a hash event ID can provide you with uniqueness for deduplication purposes, it won't be able to help you out if you're looking for sequence information. The second format tends to be a more useful option and is similar to the event stream naming strategy that we just saw earlier in this module. The service name, event type, entity identifier, and a sequence ID 
compose the event identifying string. Let's take a look at creating a structured event ID for our trusty old cart event. The event ID includes the shop domain, the cart type, the unique cart ID, and the event sequence ID. Although the cart ID uniquely identifies the cart, we rely on the sequence number to indicate which number of event it is. In this case, the one identifies that this is the first event. The event ID is published alongside the rest of the event payload, including the item map and shipping information. Say we update the event. In this case, we remove some items from the cart, update the sequence ID from 1 to 2, and create the new event ID. Note that we've explicitly used the sequence ID as part of the event ID to ensure uniqueness. A consumer that reads this event has the option to store the event ID locally in its own data store. It can use the event ID as both part of a deduplication strategy and also to ensure that it's receiving all of the events in the correct order. When reading the next event for that specific card ID, the consumer can look at two things. One, have I seen this event yet? If so, I can discard it as a duplicate. And two, is this the next event in the sequence for the cart ID? If it's not the next in the sequence, the consumer will need to make a decision. Does it wait for the properly sequenced event? Does it store it for later? Or does it just apply it and move on? Exactly what the consumer chooses to do is up to them. While event IDs are not mandatory, they are a best practice. They do not require much effort to implement and can really save consumers a lot of time and effort when it turns out that they need to deduplicate or reorder events. We recommend that you examine your need for unique event IDs as early as possible and come up with a scalable strategy for implementing them. It can be difficult and expensive to change your unique event format at a later time, so it's generally worth spending the time and effort up front to find something that works for your organization. Let's wrap up what we just covered. Event streams benefit from having a standardized name. It makes it easier for users to find and discover the data they need, while also providing a way to differentiate between similar events from different parts of your business. Event IDs provide a way to uniquely identify each event. They can be useful for ensuring correct processing order, deduplication, auditing, and debugging. Kafka's built-in metadata provides you with information about the event in relation to the topic. Meanwhile, headers provide you with the ability to add key value pairs for auditing, tracking, and compliance that live outside of the event payload. There are a number of factors to consider when designing events and event streams. In this course, we covered the four main dimensions you should consider when designing and building your events and event streams. We also took a look at best practices relating to schemas, identity, naming, and metadata. If you'd like to keep building on what you've learned in this course, I'd like to recommend you follow up with two of our other courses. First on the list is our Schema Registry 101 course. It covers schemas, evolution, and best practices for integrating with the Confluent Schema Registry. Secondly, we also have the Event Sourcing and Event Storage with Apache Kafka. In this one, we cover a few other event-related subjects, including event sourcing and command query resource separation. These subjects tie into the four main dimensions we covered today and will help extend your knowledge on available event-driven patterns. If you'd like to learn more about Confluent and Kafka, we have a wide range of freely available courses for you on Confluent Developer. I encourage you to check them out.